everyone. Welcome back. This is your host, Mariana, and you are listening to the Commitment to Growth podcast. Thank you so much to everybody for coming back. I hope that you're all doing well, that you're doing good, that you are thriving. It is a beautiful day to grow and to commit to yourself. And I hope you're excited to be here and I hope you're excited for this conversation because I definitely am. I have been planning this episode for a couple of days now, thinking about what I wanted to say and how I want to say it, why I wanted to say it. Um, I think this, uh, this is a conversation that is really important to shed light around. So in all of that, I, I hope you're ready. I hope you are ready to learn and to grow about uh, the topic of self-comparison. And without further ado, let's get right into it. Before we get into the regularly scheduled episode, I do just want to take a moment to acknowledge that I am recording this episode from the land of the Musqueam, Stalo, Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish, and Kwikwetlam First Nations, who continue to have a relationship with the land today. And I feel very grateful to be here. I feel very grateful to be an unbiased settler to this land, to be able to reside here, to have been brought up here in everything that this community has to offer. And I look forward to this new year continuing to better myself on the topic of decolonization, Indigenous sovereignty, supporting Indigenous communities. And my goal is to encourage you as well to educate yourself to step a little bit outside of your comfort zone to become familiar with what these terms mean and why they are so important to learning about them so that we can contribute to uh, their awareness and to the betterment of uh, rights and equality for Indigenous communities in our society today. So the reason why I want to talk about self-comparison today is because A, it's something that I have struggled with a lot throughout my life. I think that it's a very collective experience, but I think that because it is an experience that is associated with so can be associated with so many negative emotions, it has become this topic that is now kind of tabooed or pathologized in our society. There's this misconception that if you self-compare, you like don't have the self-worth or you don't believe in yourself, um, that you're not rooted in your abilities. And I think that's not true because self-comparison is something that is so innate to the human experience that to pathologize it and to shame it and to taboo it only creates more shame around that and the feelings of self-comparison when people experience it. So I think that by flipping the narrative and by having these conversations where we are acknowledging why it happens, why we do it, and why it is so normal to the human experience, we are helping people feel less shame around it and to better get a better grip on on self-comparison when they do experience it. So my goal with this conversation is to kind of flip your perspective and your mindset around self-comparison and hopefully give you some tips and tricks the next time that you are faced with it. So to warm us up a little bit and to warm you up as we get into today's topic, I want you to ask yourself the following questions. When do you find yourself self-comparing? How often do you find yourself self-comparing? What feelings arise when you self-compare? And why do you think that you self-compare? When are the times in which you are most prone to doing it? Is it when you are feeling low about your self-confidence after you perceive that you failed at something? Is it when you're not feeling adequate in your body, when you're having a bad body image day? When are the times in which you self-compare the most and why? I hope that you took a second there to kind of reflect on those questions so that you can better get a sense of the relationship that you have with self-comparison and why you might be prone to it. So as I mentioned before, self-comparison is something that is very innate to the human experience. And by innate, I mean that it's also very much grounded in a biological sense. It is very much rooted in our biological mechanisms to self-compare because if you think about it, it's beneficial to our survival to be constantly aware 
of the people and the things around us for multiple reasons. And I'm going to list a few here right now. So we have structures in our brain called mirror neurons. If you're not a psychology student and you're not rooted in your neurobiology, it's okay. I'll give a very brief explanation. So our mirror neurons are neurons that allow us to learn by observational learning. They're called mirror neurons because when we observe someone doing something, these neurons start firing and allow us to retain the information necessary to then mirror or copy what we just saw that person do, right? So because of this kind of innate inclination towards observing the people around us, how they're doing things, why they're doing things, so that then we can apply what they've done to our lives to serve us for whatever purpose that is, whether it's we just saw someone tie their shoe and now we have to learn how to do the same, or these are also the mechanisms by how we learn that saying please and thank you are adequate and you know normalize in society, right? Because we see people doing them and as such, once we see people doing it enough, we it is conditioned into our heads that it is kind of the socially acceptable thing to do in certain cultures, obviously. But these are the neurons that allow us to develop empathy, um, to get a sense of pe- intentions behind the things that they're doing. So right there is one kind of biological tendency that we have to be constantly observing the people around us. Another reason why it is very much in our biology to be looking around at the people around us is because we depend on being attuned to the people around us for our survival, right? What this means is that when you're attuned to somebody, you are aware and sensing the emotions and the intentions that they're giving off they might not be on point all the time but you know when we were cavemen and we just went around killing each other with picks and axes (laughs) it was easier to assume the worst in a person's intentions right in order to keep yourself safe so when we perceive somebody to be angry or frustrated based on their facial expressions, based on their body language, based on the energy or aura that they're giving off, our brain automatically assumes a threat, right? Oh my gosh, this person is angry. I need to flee or fight or flight as we biologically know it, right? On the flip side, when we're babies, this is how we also learn to self-regulate because our mothers teach us, you know, when we cry, they feed us right? And when we cry, we see that they're reacting negatively, but then as soon as they feed us or they start laughing, we learn that this is, this means that the coast is clear, right? That everything's good. But when they're angry or when we're crying and they're showing kind of that discouragement or that sadness or that frustration, we start to associate that with negativity or something, something bad, right? Because they might not then feed us if we like you know they start teaching um the concept I forget what it's called I guess like the conditioning of when you you know when you're crying you're not going to get the bottle always when you're at a certain ripe age because otherwise you know when you're a newborn it's probably just better to give you the bottle (laughs) anyways all that to say that we learn by attunement we learn by observation and as such I want you to remember that the next time you find yourself self-comparing and I want you to use that as a basis for forgiving yourself because, and I'm not saying that biology is the excuse to, is the entire excuse to our self-comparison because we're going to get into more of self-comparison and why we do it as the episode goes on. But I just want you to remember that when you are being hard on yourself and when you are shaming yourself for self-comparing because it's rooted in our biology and we're, you know, we're prone to it it's our signal that we fit in. It's our signal that, you know, we're doing what's right to fit in with our species, right? And I think that this is a large reason why people experience self-comparison when they are starting a new business project, or they're starting a new idea, something, something that people have never done before, right? Because in that instance, it's really hard to look around at people for validation or for a response that you're doing, the th- that you're doing things right and get something valuable and something that grounds you in return because if not a lot of people have done what you're doing before you 
not a lot of people can tell you that what you're doing is right or what you're doing is normal, what you're doing is common to the quote unquote species, right? So it's in those moments when you feel like you're not getting the kind of attunement or validation that you need from the people around you that it can be scariest. But again, remember that we're prone to it because nature still wins, our biology still reigns over us. Um, you know, we've seen that with COVID now. So forgive yourself the next time you self-compare because you're not the only person that does it. And it's very innate and normal to the new human experience. To add to that, I think it's important to remember and to recognize that self-comparison isn't all bad, right? Self-comparison is actually to thank for a lot of the positive things about the human experience. So self-comparison helps us notice the areas of our life that need improvement, right? It is our motivator for filling the gap that exists between where we are now and where we want to be, right? When we're comparing ourselves to people that are in either higher positions at work than us, um, their business is six figures while our own, ours only maybe three or four, right? People who are in higher academic standing than we are, people who are in higher athletic standing we are, right? When we look up to those people and we tell ourselves, I wanna be where they are, you're self-comparing, but it's fueling your drive to keep working harder, right? So self-comparison in that aspect isn't all bad. It also allows us to empathize with others and give advice because when we notice somebody that is at a place that we once were at, but now we're not, and we've grown out of that place in which we found ourselves at one point, whether it be good or bad, um, it allows us to forgive the people who might be in such places and also you know, give them advice when they come to us. So what do I mean by this? Let's give the example of siblings. I find this with my younger sister a lot. She's three years younger than I am. She's 18, I'm 21. It's easy. She graduated high school at the end of June of last year, of 2021. And I remember seeing her go through a lot of the same things that I went through in high school. You know, when you think that, friend groups are like your whole life and you think that high school is like the best thing in the world it's like the only thing that exists in the world so you're worried about popularity you're worried about boys you know and then you know eventually you grow out of it and you realize that it's definitely most definitely not the only thing in the world and not the only thing that is important to life and so as I saw her go through a lot of the same things that I went through it was way easier for me to empathize with her and to understand why she was thinking those things because you know you can only meet people where they are and where they're willing to go and like I said when you're in high school you only have experienced a fraction of what it's like to be you know a post-pubescent adolescent <laughs> not driven by your hormones um and there's only so much to be known about the human experience when you're at that right age and I don't say that to paint myself as somebody who has lived the human experience because I'm only three years her major, right? I'm 21, but it's a big difference in age to experience a lot of things that she might not have yet. So self-comparison in that aspect allows us to empathize with others in a way that allows us to deepen our connections with them. Now, while self-comparison has its benefits, I think it's important to acknowledge them, to help us not see it as this thing that is worth being feeling shame around obviously there are downfalls and that's probably why you click this episode in the first place and you might be experiencing more of the downsides than the benefits and that's why you're here today so let's just touch on some of the downsides of self-comparison why it can become toxic when it can become toxic and how framing it as this innately bad thing can lead you to then develop a bad relationship with it. So self-comparison can cause discouragement if you measure how far you have to go versus where somebody else is. So like I mentioned earlier, if you are at a lower level in athletics than somebody that you really aspire and you're comparing the journey that you still have to do 
to the journey that they already did and you start focusing on the length on the amount of hard work it's going to take um how much you're going to have to sacrifice you know all the things that come with being a professional athlete for example if that's your end goal you're more likely to get discouraged and feel ambivalent towards actually moving forward so if you're comparing the length of somebody else's journey to your own while neglecting the fact that everybody's journey is different and you can't ever directly compare your own journey to somebody else's because yours is going to come with different twists and turns and different highs and lows you're more likely to get discouraged and not move forward in the way that you want to or prevent more rapid progress because now you are focusing on well we won't call it negative because I don't think that the obstacles that we face in our journey are are ever bad they can be hard but they're never bad because they, they teach us what we need to learn from the situation but if you focus on the journey and the length of it you're more likely to get discouraged the other thing about self-comparison that can become negative is that it can cause you to think that you're not good enough if you keep doing bad and if you can't achieve the same results as somebody else so say you want to get into public speaking right your dream is to become a world-renowned public speaker if you're comparing to yourself to somebody say like Jay Shetty or Gabby Bernstein who have been in the business for a long time and they're used to performing in front of thousands of people but you might have only done you know like your high school class or your university class and you found yourself breaking down in nervousness and not doing well and missing lines and stuff if you perceive that as a failure that has now made you less worthy of achieving the thing that you're dreaming of and then you're comparing your perceived failure to the people who are above you and whose level you want to get to that is when self-comparison can become negative because again you're not only measuring and focusing on measuring the journey that you have to take to where you want to be but you're also associating in your mind that these people were just born with this innate ability to public speak and obviously behind every success story are more failures than successes right and I think that's a really key thing to remind ourselves is that behind every success story there were multiple trials and tribulations and multiple falls and multiple times where people that have succeeded have have had to find the strength to move forward again despite the failure so when you focus on your failures and tie your worth to those failures that is when self-comparison can become bad another aspect of self-comparison that can lead you to having a toxic relationship with it is when you use it as a way to self-validate to boost your ego so we all have times when we are low on confidence for multiple reasons be it our body image be it thinking that we're not a good partner that we're not a good friend that we're not a good son or daughter and in those moments when our dopamine is low it's very i'm about to point out another biological uh tendency to self-compare here i just realized um <laughs> It's very natural for our brain to seek instant gratification because it feels good, right? It's quick. It's a good boost, boost of dopamine to get us feeling back to our normal selves. However, when we seek those instant forms of gratification, often what we're feeding is our ego, right? Because if you think about how many times you might have done this and again I don't want you to shame yourself for it because it's so normal and it is so normal to want to feel loved and accepted and validated but if you think about the amount of times that you might have done this one way or another whether it was through scrolling through comments on your Instagram that where people were saying that you were pretty if you or handsome or good looking you know if you're if you posted a selfie or that you had a nice body or when you went to your partner and asked you know am I a good am I a good partner and you probably knew the answer to that already um and they say yes how many times has that validation actually led you to feel fulfilled and 
rooted in the knowledge that you are either pretty or good looking, like you went to your comments to confirm, or that you are a good partner. Right? We self, we seek self validation. And yet, most often when we actually get it, it doesn't make us feel any better, or it's either a transitory feeling before we find ourselves wanting to do it again. So when we are focused on feeling that instant gratification and that boost of confidence through doing things rapidly that, you know, that assure us of the things that we are suddenly insecure about, it doesn't actually do anything for us, right? And as such, because it doesn't do anything for us and because in the long run, it doesn't make us feel that much better about ourselves, we tend to self-compare even more because if it's not assuring and comforting in the moment, then we're going to keep believing that the thing that we're insecure about is actually true, right? We're actually not a good partner or we're actually not pretty and beautiful because we don't feel that way and we're not getting it through that self-validation. So if you continue to self-compare and you continue to seek that self-validation, you're more likely to keep seeking it more because it's not actually nurturing when, or it's, I'll say that it's not always nurturing in the long run when you seek it to fill the ego. The last point I'll say about the downsides of self-comparison here is that when you self-compare, it can lead to intense feelings of jealousy. Now, I'm going to be talking about jealousy later in this episode and going into a little bit more depth about it, but jealousy, again, another very innate feeling to the human experience, but jealousy is a very slippery slope towards persistent discontent because when you're jealous, you're comparing yourself to somebody else, what somebody else has or doesn't have as it relates to their abilities, to their money, to the relationship, to their friendships, whatever it is that you're comparing yourself to them about. And where jealousy can become a slippery slope is if it leads you to then develop resentment towards that person because you don't have it. So jealousy, especially if it's about a friend or a partner or a sibling or a parent, somebody close to you in your life, it can lead to resentment that then can kill that relationship, right? If you self-compare enough to the point where it becomes rooted in anger and resentment towards a person, it can start harming your relationships and it can start harming how you view the world around you. So now that we've talked about when self-comparison can become toxic and the downsides of self-comparison when you look at it through this outlook, because again, what we're trying to do today is reshape our outlook around it. Let's talk about why you might be self-comparing. So you may be self-comparing because you're focusing too much on your failures versus on what you can control to move forward proactively to flip the situation or simply focusing on your successes, right? We're going to get into that a little bit more with the rest of the episode, but The other reason why you might be self-comparing is because you've been told by others that you're incompetent or unworthy in a certain area of your life. Again, be it dating, relationships, finances, school, academics. School and academics are the same thing. (laughs) Um, I meant athletics. Sorry. Um, You know, it's very different when we perceive ourselves to be one thing, but then somebody either tells us that we are one thing or somebody validates what we thought about ourselves. And that can really hurt. And that can make it sometimes harder for us to flip the narrative that is going on in our heads. But please remember that the only person that can dictate your worth what value you bring and what you're capable of is you. And again, we're going to be talking about this when we get into the tips to avoid self-comparing or to get better with your relationship with self-comparison, but it does hurt and you're not weird or sensitive for reacting to the words of others in a negative light. It's completely normal we tend to value the words of others over our own sometimes, but 
again, you're the only one that dictates your worth and your value and your capabilities. Please keep this in mind. I do believe that you can do anything that you set your mind to. So that is not the energy that we're carrying in 2022. Okay, we're, we're, thinking, we're thinking positive this year. <laughs> but um, the other reason why, or another reason why you may be self-comparing is because you're focusing more on your weaknesses versus your strengths. So the areas that we tend to self-compare in, like I mentioned before, are the areas in which we are less developed than the people above us or the people that have succeeded in a certain area. And when we spend time focusing on how these weaknesses are slowing us down, how they are preventing us from reaching success, how they are contributing to our failure. Again, we're more likely to become discouraged and not move forward with our project because we are focusing so much on fixing these weaknesses and spending energy focusing on them and ruminating over maybe how to work around them or how to build them into perfection, how to build them up to the same level that these people are at, right? But Instead, if we see them as opportunities to become better versions of ourselves and look at our strengths and leverage those, we're more likely to move forward faster and piggyback off of our strengths to help boost our weaknesses. Now, the last thing I'll say about why you might be self-comparing is because you don't have a clear path toward your goals paved out. And it's causing you to feel directionless. I think that so often when we start out, like I've mentioned a bunch of times on this podcast now, on a project, when we're starting a new business, when we're getting into a new sport, when we're getting into a new relationship, it's really easy to feel like we're just going with the flow and being aimless with our actions, right? Because we've never experienced this before, because we've never found ourselves on this trajectory before, maybe it's a new trajectory, we've never explored this area of life before, and as such, it's really hard, like I mentioned earlier, to get the validation that you are seeking from others, to get that attunement from other people, when you're not even sure of what you're looking for, because you've never explored this area, right? And so, when you feel aimless, you're going to start self-comparing, right? When you feel so aimless or so directionless that you don't know what subsequent steps to take, you might start completely copying the path of what somebody else did, right? So we see so recurrently now in the media, you know, people posting my 10-step guide to become successful or my step-by-step morning routine or here's a day in my life kind of thing. And while I think these are cool to watch, and while I think that these are good things to gain inspiration from, there's a difference between gaining inspiration from them and copying them to a T. Because once we do, we fall into the trap of thinking that if we're not doing them step by step, it's going to fail, or that we have the same life trajectory as somebody else, right? If it's not working for us, or well, then it's because we're not doing it right or because we're just, we're failures, right? So aimlessness, feelings of directionless do not make you weak. They do not make you ignorant or dumb or whatever, right? These are the moments in which you are capable of growing the most if you commit to learning from other people, to seeking inspiration from them while lying and rooting yourself in the knowledge that this life and this path is yours to create and if you start copying somebody else's formula and expect it to work wonders in your life it might but how much cooler is it if you create your own formula that then you get to talk to others about later and that you get to know at the end of the day that you got yourself through this because you committed to learning and readapting and reevaluating your process, right? So seek inspiration from but never copy the formulas of others because 
everyone's formula is different and you can't ever expect somebody's formula to do the wonders that your own formula would do for you. All right, so now that we've talked about why we self-compare at an innate biological level, why self-comparison can be good, in which instances it can serve us, the downsides of self-comparison, when it can become toxic, and why you might be self-comparing. I hope that that resonated with you guys, and I hope that that struck some kind of aha moment, like, oh my gosh, this is me, this is what I do. But I also hope that that all served to help you forgive yourself a little bit, to be a little bit less hard on yourself, and to remind you that this is something that is so normal, so inherent to the human experience, and you're not a bad person for comparing yourself to anyone else because I think that it's also a symbol that the thing about which you're comparing yourself about is something that you deeply care about and something that you want to get good at. It's something, it's a version of yourself that you aspire to be. So please don't shame yourself for self comparing. And I hope that here in the next section, we're going to talk about, um, how to develop a better relationship with self-comparison in a way that can serve you. I hope that this section helps reframe your mindset around this topic and you can use self-comparison to serve you the next time it's not or the next time that you find yourself entering the negative loop that self-comparison can become. The first pointer that I want to give you on developing your relationship with self-comparison is I want you to develop the self-awareness to challenge your thoughts when you find yourself self-comparing. I think that, unfortunately, self-awareness has become this thing that is painted in our society as something that is only achieved by the elite of the elite. Like, only if you've spent tons of years on Earth and you've gone and meditated in the Andes and I don't know, you've died and come back to life and you know your limitations and your full range of capabilities, only then are you self-aware in this life. And I frankly disagree with that. And I don't think that self-awareness has to be this thing that is complicated because how can you know the limits or the range of your capabilities especially in an area in which you've never set foot in before, right? So this pertains a lot to people who, like I said, are just developing their business. They're just starting it. They're just getting into a particular sport. They're just getting into a relationship. How do you know the extent of your abilities when you've never tested them in that particular setting before, right? So I think that self-awareness comes down to two fundamental things. It's your ability to recognize that your mind tells stories and you are not those stories. Your mind regurgitates information that it sees and it can work against you or it can work for you. And the second thing is that you are capable of flipping the narrative to serve you. So like I said, it's really hard to tell yourself, I am a good business owner or I am a good partner when you've never been in a relationship or you've never started a business, right? Like it can be really hard to say those affirmations to yourself and believe them when you've never been tested in that scenario before. But I want you to not kind of use those pseudo affirmations. And when they don't feel good, that means that you're not a good business owner, a good partner or a good sibling or a good friend or whatever that area that you're comparing yourself in is. It's about challenging that narrative that your mind is telling you and saying, okay, what evidence is there that I am not a good business owner? What evidence is there that I am not a good partner, right? If you find some or if you make some up for yourself because there is a difference and it's important to notice that difference, then make a plan as to how you are going to better yourself in that area. But if you find none, that doesn't mean that you have to look harder. It may, it might, if your partner is 
let's say in the case of dating, your partner is communicating some kind of discontent to you. However, in that sense, I think that the person should come out and tell you. And this just took an entirely different turn from where I, <laughs> this point was going. But point being, point being, when you start challenging those thoughts and not saying, you know, I'm a good soccer player, even though I've never played soccer before, or I'm a good business owner, even though I've never had a business before. It's about flipping the narrative to not pseudo affirmations, but saying, I am capable of developing my skills to become a good business owner, a good soccer player, a good person that saves money, a good person that is in a fulfilling relationship, whatever that is, right? Don't lie to yourself. Instead, commit to growth and to development of your abilities because that's why we're here on this podcast, right? It's called the Commitment to Group podcast for a reason. But um, tip number one is to develop the self-awareness to challenge those narratives and don't use pseudo affirmations. Commit to developing yourself in the areas in which you need to grow to become successful. My second tip for you to reframe your mindset around self-comparison is to begin preparing for big moments in which you have to show up. There's a saying by Zig Ziglar that says, success is when opportunity meets preparation. And so often, I think that the reason why we find ourselves comparing our work or our performance to those of others is because we didn't prepare adequately before the moment in which we had to show up. And so when that happens, you know, we can either drown ourselves in pity and tell ourselves that the results were rigged or whatever um, the situation you were in was, but more often we're prone to digging ourselves in pity and to making up excuses for why we didn't achieve the desired result because we know deep down that we didn't prepare to the extent that we could have. And that can lead down a very negative slope of self-comparison. Instead, If you prepare the way that you need to, to show up and give your best, whether it's a public speaking, whether it's at a sporting competition, even if you don't get the desired outcome, you can walk away knowing that you did what you could to achieve the best outcome possible for you. And that's very different than achieving sometimes the desired outcome that you would have wanted because if you fail or if in your eyes you perceive to fail, that doesn't mean that that is not an opportunity for you to associate your worth with that failure or your ability to do that thing with your failure. This is now an instance in which you can use self-comparison as a tool to look at the people who might have done better than you and say, okay, what gaps are they filling that I am not? And how can I use them not use them, but (laughs) inquire with them, to them about how they can help me move forward with the skills that they already have developed that I may need to work on. So this is an example in which self-comparison can actually come in handy if you choose to analyze the people that you look up to, to gather the data necessary to strengthen your weaknesses are the areas that you need to develop the most to achieve your desired success. The third tip I want to give you when you are struggling with self-comparison or you are heading into a situation in which you are prone to self-comparing in is to commit to failing. This is a big reminder that I am carrying with me into 2022 and I think that it's one that has been both comforting and liberating to me because I think that we are so prone to working our goals and our roadmap towards our goals around not failing because we are so deathly afraid as human beings of the toll that failure can take on us, whether it's disappointment, whether it's sadness, frustration, um, completely giving up on the thing that we're doing and that we love. We are so terrified of not achieving 
the thing that we want to achieve that we forget that failure is the biggest teacher that life has gifted us with. And so when you commit to failing and you commit to setting failure as a teacher that again can also highlight those gaps that you need to fill to get to where you want to be, not only are you developing a good relationship with failure, but you're also developing the confidence necessary to fall and get back up because failure at the end of the day is a test for us to continue readapting and to continue being resilient in life at the thing that we're trying to do right when we recognize that life is all about readapting our plan and our approach to the things that are difficult to things that we want to achieve the more creative and the better we can get at getting back up because it's all about being innovative. It's all about trusting that we have what it takes to reframe our roadmap and to overcome the obstacles that we're faced with. So when you commit to failure, you're less likely to self-compare because then you are looking at failure as a possibility again to become a better version of yourself to readapt your plan but again also to look at the people who may have succeeded in comparison to you and say okay what can I learn from them what can I gain from them what can I gain from their strengths to help leverage my own or to help lift up my weaknesses so in 2022 and for the rest of your life commit to failure to avoid negatively self-comparing when you could be using failure as a proactive tool to help you get forward. Tip number four that I have for you to help you reframe your relationship with self-comparison is to get in the habit of comparing yourself to your past self. Now, in the last couple of months, I've become a really big fan of psychologist Benjamin Hardy. Um, for those of you who don't know, he is a co-author of the book The Gap and the Gain with Dan Sullivan. He has a YouTube channel. Um, he hosts a lot of things. He, he has a lot of things. <laughs> he um, runs a course called the Future Self Course, which is like a group of people who get together every week and they discuss about their future self plans and how they're getting there. And this guy is so cool and he's doing such good things for the world. I admire him a lot, but his book, The Gap in the Gain with Dan Sullivan, I have yet to read. I really, really want to, but he talks about a lot in his videos. And the main idea behind the gap in the gain is that the gap is where you are now versus where your future self wants to be. And the gain is what you're getting to fill that gap, to bring yourself closer to your future self. And the best way to do that the best way to find motivation and drive and encouragement when you're going through your journey towards becoming your future self is learning to compare where you are now versus where your past self once was and gaining encouragement and worthiness and confidence from the knowledge that you have grown, even if it feels minuscule. So when you start taking the attention away from the people around you, and I don't mean this to say that you shouldn't at all compare yourself to other people, because I also don't think that, I think there's a lot of downsides to living in a shell and pretending that you're the only person alive, because then you can't ever expect to get inspired by how others did things before you or how others have approached situations so that you can take their ideas to benefit your own approach, as an example. But I also think that there's a benefit to realizing that if you're comparing yourself because you want to be exactly like that person or because you want to achieve the exact same thing that a certain person did, you're failing to realize that if you were just like everyone else, you would be unfulfilled. And you're failing to realize that the beauty of the gap, which is again, where your past self was and where you are now is that you get to carve out that path for yourself. And what's included in your path 
is what life has set out for you. So why wouldn't you want to live that and explore that? So get into the habit of comparing yourself to your past self to gain confidence from that and to gain momentum from looking at your own progress. Tip number five is to remember that not everything you see in the media is real life. So I talked about this briefly at the beginning of the episode when I said that, you know, behind every success story is a mound of failures and times where the person had to get back up and readdress the situation and their approach to the situation. Now, I think that the other reason we find ourselves self-comparing is because we fail to realize that all the prettiness, all the sunshine, rainbows, and unicorns (laughs) that we see people on Instagram and YouTube and Twitter and Snapchat portray on their stories and their posts is that that is only a fraction of the life that those people are living behind that screen, right? Because again, behind all pretty moments, there's a dozen, a handful of dozens of ugly ones that have either led that person to the happy moment or it's also easy to be dishonest and to pretend that you're doing okay when you're actually not, right? So remind yourself that it's not always supposed to be positive. You're not supposed to be happy-go-lucky every moment of the day because you are a human that goes through emotions that are inherent and necessary for your experience. And the more that we can accept that we're not meant to be in a constant state of happiness all the time, and if we're anything but there's something wrong with us, the more we can accept that reality, the more fulfilled we're going to be and the better relationship we're going to have with the present moment and the emotions and things that we're experiencing in that present moment. So my tip number five for you is to stop comparing yourself to other people based on what you're seeing them portray on their online life because it is only a fraction of the reality that they're living behind the screen. My tip number six for you is to remember that jealousy is an egoic response. I mentioned this earlier in the podcast and how jealousy can lead us to developing resentment with the people around us, but this is a really important one to remember because when you feel jealous towards something or someone, it's highlighting that you have an insecurity that needs to be addressed. And if you're comparing yourself to somebody based on an ability that they have that you don't or figures that you have that your bit figures that they have that your business doesn't have or a relationship that they have that you don't have, it's up to you to take that thought and say, okay, what insecurity or what need is my jealousy, my self-comparison poking at versus oh my gosh well they have it because of this or they have it because they're just luckier than I am or they're they have it because they were just born for it or they have it because they don't actually deserve it or instead of making stories up in your head about why someone may have something that you don't turn jealousy into something proactive turn jealousy into questions what did they do to get there how can I get there? How can I study what they did to help get me there? If you study people and see them as teachers, if you study the people that are above you in a certain area and use their success as a reminder that it can be done, you are turning your jealousy into something proactive and something that is not going to lead to resentment later. If you stop seeing people above you as rivals and instead as teachers, as sources of information, as sources of motivation, you're fueling your own journey by enhancing the connection that you have to the people around you and to the way that you're seeing your weaknesses as as not something that highlight that you're a failure, but as highlights that it's just an area where you're capable of growing in. So Turn your jealousy into something proactive 
versus ruminating on what you have and what you don't have and making excuses for yourself. Tip number seven, I kind of briefly mentioned this in number six, but remind yourself that if others did it, you can too. If you treat the people around you, the people that you admire because of their successes as living, walking, breathing example and pieces of evidence that that thing can be done, why wouldn't you strive for it? There is living, walking evidence in front of you that the thing that you are trying so hard to achieve is at your fingertips if you just commit. So remind yourself that the people who you are looking up to, the people that you admire, the people that you, whose lives you want, which you shouldn't, to a T, <laughs> are examples that it can be done and you are capable of doing it too if you just commit to the hard work. Because I think that's what so often ends up being the source of focus. And I mentioned this earlier as well, is that we end up focusing on the journey and the grit and the hard work and the pain that it's going to take to get to where we want to be. But if the people that achieved it already, if their living example is evidence that the pain was worth it or that the pain or and the sacrifice and the commitment amounted to more pros than cons, why wouldn't you want to keep striving for that thing? So use the people around you as examples and evidence that what you want to do can be done. That's my tip number seven for you. My tip number eight for you as you navigate your relationship with self-comparison is to remember that the things that make you you, the things that are unique to you, are the things that bring flavor to the lives of the people around you that you hold close. I think that we tend to compare our friendships to those of others. Like, what do I not have that that friend is giving that friend or that, that partner is giving that partner or, or I need to get better in this area so that this person will love me more or accept me more. That we forget that the people that we're close with love us and cherish us because of the things that because of the things about us that we are bringing to the table at this present moment and when we forget that we start focusing our outlook on our relationships on what they're lacking and that can lead to chronic discontentment so this is a conversation that I had with my roommate and a couple months ago and I don't think I'll ever forget it because it was so like it just it caused me to have such an aha moment that I have valued it so much ever since and I've used it in so many examples. I think I might have even mentioned the in one of the podcasts of the of one of the episodes of the podcast, but we were talking in our kitchen and my roommate Eleanor told me that it scared her to think that people didn't see things the way that she did in certain areas. Like she told me that she couldn't fathom that people don't experience blue the way that she sees blue because to her it's such an enriching and incredible experience the way that she sees blue but I told her you know I think that what makes our friendship so cool is that through your eyes I can see blue that way even if I don't ever get as close to how you see it learning how you see blue is what enhances my experience as your friend because then I'm getting to see blue in a different light than the way that I see it already. So reminding yourself that the things that make you unique and the parts of you that make you who you are are what add value and perspective and cheer to the relationships in your life is so key instead of focusing on what you don't have. So Yes, you can totally develop your listening or your ability to ask better questions or your ability to be more vulnerable if, as examples, if that's what you're looking to develop. But being happy with where you are and 
seeking and looking to your relationships for ways on how to work together to develop those areas is the better way of reframing that outlook versus focusing on, oh my gosh, what do I have that they don't have? And because I don't have the ability to be vulnerable or open, I'm making this person unhappy, so I should just leave. No, collaborate with the people close to you to help you develop those skills versus being consistently unhappy about them. So remember that the things that make you you are what add light and value to your closest relationships and look to your relationships to help you leverage the areas that you want to become better at. Tip number nine to help you develop your outlook on self-comparison is to analyze your experiences every day. This is by asking yourself what went well, what didn't go so well, and celebrate the things that went well. The more you acknowledge your wins, even if you perceive them to be small, the more confidence you're building in yourself to do future tasks. And again, the less desire and need you're going to feel to look to the people around you and self-compare. But it's also important to acknowledge the faults that you might've had in a day. Because I think that if we only spend time acknowledging the good parts and the accomplishments and neglecting the failures, we're also not getting better. And we're also neglecting that there are areas in which we could become better at. And if you could become better at human at something, why wouldn't you want to be? Because that's only going to enhance your experience on this earth that much better. So analyze your experiences every day. Ask yourself what went well. Celebrate that but also make a plan to improve on the things that did not go so well to become a better human from them. And my last tip for you guys to help you develop a better relationship with self-comparison is allow yourself to feel the emotions that you're experiencing from a situation and see what they bring up for you. Because I think that we tend to shy away from difficult emotions. I've said this a lot on the podcast, but I think that as I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, when we can accept that emotions ebb and flow because we are human and because we have feelings and we have experiences that have conditioned us to feel certain way about things or people or outcomes or whatever that is for you that triggers a specific emotion, we can accept ourselves and the things that we feel much more because we deserve to feel things and we deserve to use our emotions as signposts to help us address the areas about that we feel a certain way about just because we feel negatively towards a certain thing it doesn't mean that that makes that thing negative or that we should avoid that thing it might just mean that we have to readdress our approach or our outlook on that thing because the one that we carry right now might be negative. So say that you are really afraid of breakups and you find yourself constantly ruminating over the fear of your partner breaking up with you. It's completely normal, A, because you love the person and because you want to be with that person, because you want to spend time with that person. But if you find yourself constantly ruminating on it and then that fear leading you to avoiding confrontation or avoiding expressing your needs with your partner, you're not living out the kind of relationship experience that it could be if you were honest. And then that's also leading to possible resentment because if your needs aren't being met, then you're going to be unhappy or you're going to feel like something is missing, right? So if you reframe your emotion and not treat it as this thing that is bad or that you're wrong for fearing it, but instead as understanding that you were conditioned to fear breakups because they mean, you know, all the sadness and having to restart and all the things that our society has associated with breakups to instead thinking, how can I make this partnership the best it can possibly be in the future? And instead putting all of your energy into the now You've just used your emotions as a tool to recondition your 
previously perceived notions. So number 10, allow yourself to feel the emotions, see what they're bringing up for you and use them as teachers to help you get forward in a certain area of your life. And that is all for today, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to the Commitment to Growth podcast, you guys. I hope that this episode resonated with you and I hope that I have managed to change your outlook on self-comparison a little bit and help you develop a more proactive and healthier relationship with it because, again, it's something we all experience, something that we all do not have to feel like we have to shy away from and it is a part of the human experience that we can use to help us become better versions of ourselves. So, Let me know in the comments what you thought about it. Please don't forget to hit like and subscribe on the podcast platform over which you're listening. And if you have a comment or a future topic or something you want to DM me about, please go to at Commitment to Growth Podcast on Instagram or Facebook. I am on both those platforms. I'm always happy to hearing what you have to say. And don't forget to subscribe to the Commitment to Growth newsletter. You can go also to my bio on Instagram. Again, it's at commitment to growth podcast on instagram hit the link in my bio sign up for the newsletter receive more sources of growth right in your inbox every single week to help you get further on your self-development journey and all said and done i hope you guys are doing well i hope you have a great rest of your week and i look forward to the next episode have a great rest of your day